Welcome to our second lecture on the Egan Skilled Helper model. So let me just quickly just do a recap for us, and then we'll pick it up from where we left off. Okay, good. So on Thursday, what did we cover? Well, first and foremost, what I did was I began our evening by giving all of us a quick overview about a typical problem-solving approach. Thereafter, I began to do a comparison and a contrast between a typical problem-solving approach and the Egan Skilled Helper approach or model. And we found out that the Egan Skilled Helper model is kind of different from a typical problem-solving approach. How so? Well, if you look essentially at the Egan's model, it is basically a very solution-focused approach. It is a very goal-orientated approach as opposed to a pure, typical problem-solving approach. And based on that, what did we do? Then we began to look into a quick overview about the three stages of the Egan's model, followed by having a quick overview of all the major tasks which is within the Egan Skilled Helper model. And thereafter, we began to focus our attention on looking at the first stage of the Egan's model, which is none other than the current picture. And we spend the bulk of our time really looking at the first task within stage one, which is called story. Okay, and that's where uh, we, I use the song uh, because of you. And then we also went to look into some of the questions we can ask to facilitate our clients to tell us more about the story which they are bringing to see us for counseling. Okay, so that was what we covered as of last Thursday's lecture. Okay, good. So, any quick questions for me before we get rolling for tonight? Are we good? Good. Okay, thank you so much for that. Trust you had a good weekend. All right. So, tonight, what will be in store for all of us? Well, tonight, my major focus will be on unpacking the second task within Search 1, followed by the third task within Search 1, and I'm really, really hoping that there'll be time for you to do a role play together. Then, of course, after that, I hope to introduce to all of you stage two of the Egan's model. It's none other than the preferred picture. So that's all what I have resolved for us for tonight's lecture. Okay? But before that, I wanted to do some clarification about how we label all the tasks within the Egan's model. Some of you might actually felt a bit confused uh, after last Thursday lecture. I wanted to clarify that uh, for all of us. Okay, so now, could I just invite uh, Zana to upload the um, handout one latest on the Zoom group chat? I think she already uploaded the handout one overview in the link already, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, that's right. So Zana, over to you. Yeah. Thank it's you so much, nice. Zana. Yeah, that's right. So the, this particular handout is uploaded to the link already, right, Zana? Yes, that's correct. Good, Ken. So you guys can download it from two, two areas, one through the link, and the other you can also download it from the Zoom group chat as well. Okay, so let me just quickly cover this view. So here we go. Okay, if you look at the, this particular handout, okay, let me just uh, give me a second, or let's shift all your videos to my other screen. Okay, good. I can see all of you clearly. Okay, now you notice that this particular handout is kind of different from the one that I shared last Thursday. How is it different? Well, I added in the names of the task for all the tasks within the Egan Skill Helper model. So, come, let me just quickly run you through what are the names all about so they don't get confused. Okay, so here we go. Now, you notice, know, right? that for every task in this particular diagram, there are basically two numberings, if you can see. Let me just give you a brief overview. So, if you take a look at... Okay, let me just scroll up a bit more. If you take a look at stage one, right, stage one. Task one on story. Notice, the way I labeled story was, it can be called task one, or it can be called task 1A. So, why? Why are there two labels for each task? Well, here comes the reason. Now, 
the Egan's book have undergone 11th edition. So I say again, the Egan's book has undergone 11th edition. So guess what? Now, when we first began to teach this module, it was all the way where it was edition number seven. And look how far we have come. Now, if you look at the book, it's at the 11th edition. So guess what? So if you can see over here, right? Now, task one here basically applies to the earlier edition of the book. In particular, the 8th edition. Okay, so I say again, task one, this neighboring, refers to the 8th edition of the Egan Skilled Helper book. Whereas, if you look at the 10th edition, as well as the 11th edition, guess what? Now we call task one, 1A. Are you still with me, my friends? So this is where, right? Why then am I making things confusing for you? Here comes the reason. Now, I do not really know which particular edition are you having with you. Some of us, you might still be using the 8th edition. Some of us, we might have upgraded to use the 10th or the 11th edition. So I want to make sure that I'm covering all the editions to the best I can. And the second reason why I'm proposing this is because on Friday, when you are given the link to do your MCQ assessment, now this is where right, it gets a bit confusing. Huh? Now, when I set the MCQ questions, I set the questions based on the 8th edition. In other words, right, as you look through, as you go through the MCQ assessment, you will find that the way the questions are structured is based on the numbering here. So it could be task 1, task 2, task 3, and whatever. Lah. But because I want to make things very updated for this particular intake, right? I want to make sure that I'm using the more latest numbering, which is really task 1A, 1B, as well as 1C. That's why you notice, right, that all the handouts that I will be giving you, they are all based on the later additions numbering. You saw that we are updated about how Egan is now laboring all the tasks within his model. Got it? But when you are doing your MCQ assessment, this is where la, you have to begin to equate. La. So if you see a question that's talking about task 1 of stage 1, it's basically referring to task 1A. Got it? If you were to look at the question that asks you, oh, task 2 of stage 2, it's referring to task 2B. Got it? So it's really for you to remember this. La, so that as you go about doing your assessment, you will not be as confused. But for this particular three lectures, I'll be using the labeling on the right, which is all here. So 1A, 1B, followed by 1C, 2A, 2B, 2C, followed by 3A, 3B, as well as 3C. So that'll be for our purposes of going through this module. But for the MCQ, you will find that it will be based on the left, which is Task 1, task 2, task 3 for stage 1. Task 1, task 2, task 3 for stage 2. As well as task 1, task 2, task 3 for stage 3. Okay, because when I set the MCQ, it was based on the 8th edition textbook. So I hope that's not too confusing for you to understand. Okay, yeah. Okay. Any questions for me up to this point in time about the labeling? So I hope it's clear enough. Okay, huh? okay, good. Okay, so now, to begin our evening together, I would like all of us to be getting into groups. So, getting into groups to discuss about what? Let me just show you this particular uh, handout, I mean, or this particular discussion. Okay, could I invite all of you to read through this slide? And then I'll explain to you like, the requirements for this particular group discussion in a moment. Okay, all done. Good, let's talk about it. So in a moment, I'll be inviting Zana to be breaking you out into breakout rooms. Now, within your breakout rooms, I would like each group to be discussing two very important questions. First question is all about what might be some aspects 
within your client's story that might need some challenging from us being their counselors. So very important, my friends, as you answer the first question, I want you to go beyond Kelly's story. Got it? I want you to go beyond Kelly's story. Okay, good. Now, once in your groups you have brainstormed the various different aspects that needs challenging, second question, in your groups discuss what might be some possible strategies that counsellors can use to help their clients challenge these aspects during counselling. So example, let's say one of the aspects, for example, that may need challenging in counselling could be some maladaptive thinking, some irrational thinking, for example. Now, second question you have to discuss, okay? So how am I then able to help my client to challenge their yeah? maladaptive thinking? How am I going to help my clients to challenge their yeah? irrational thinking? Got it? So if every aspect that's been identified that is challenging, brainstorm what might be some possible strategies that you can be using during counselling to challenge your client for this particular aspect of their yeah? story. Okay, so I hope I'm clear about the instructions. Okay, all right. Okay, so without further ado, let me invite Zana to be dividing and breaking it out into breakout rooms. So over to you, Zana. All right, thank you so much for doing that. Okay, free for all again. So anyone from any group can chip in to talk about what we discussed just now. Let me quickly just share the screen with you. Okay, I've created this particular table uh, to hopefully lah, document down all the good ideas that came up in your group discussions. Okay, good. So let's first talk about the first question, shall we? So, as you listen to your client's story at task 1A, I'm sure there might be certain aspects within your client's story that might require some form of challenging. So, what might be some examples of these aspects? Anyone from any group? Chip in. Maybe I can share what my group says. Sure, go okay. for it. Um, mm. Well, one area that we thought about could be communication is through the story that the client shares with the counsellor. Okay. Um, mm. It's not, you sense it's not very accurate. It's like, you probably had some background that this is the counsellor who's taking help, but Mm. Which means the communication is not very, um, okay, like a better word is the, the client was not able to communicate properly what the story is about. Mm. Okay. Mm. So how can you tell that that seems to be the difficulty of the client? How can the you tell? Uh, incoherent, like probably the client was saying something mm. else like A and after that in the between story say something else. Which okay. is, you, is that everywhere, la, the, the client may oh. not be very consistent in what okay. he or she is sharing. I see. Let me just write down. Huh? So, uh, so one sign could be that your client is jumping from topic to topic. Would it be fair to say? Not right. Okay. Let me just write down. Huh? So, uh, client seems to be mm, changing. Seems to be changing. Uh, topics rather fast. Okay, so that might be some well, a particular aspect they may want to challenge. Okay, Ken, thanks, Anne and gang. <laughs> okay, other other groups, yeah, other aspects that you might want to challenge. Uh, I'll share. Sure, then go for it. Uh, one of the things we talked about was the emotions. Emotions. Uh, maybe uh, the emotions do not match up to the story, mm. like okay. the uh, like fake emotions. Emo fake emotions. Okay, okay. So, okay. so what what we mean ah, is me that like, mm, that's right, like yes. the client might be telling us a story, and then okay. uh, that it, it like maybe lost somebody, it should be grief ah. and sad, but then okay. it came out like oh, ah, 
oh, happy uh, kind of thing. Uh. I see. Thank you so much. Okay. So maybe use a technical word here. It will be some discrepancy between the verbal content of the story and the emotions being expressed. Okay. So the word discrepancy uh, is being used a lot in the counseling field. So let me just put it down. So discrepancy between uh, client's story and the emotions expressed. Hmm, very good. Thanks, Ning and gang. Other groups, other aspects. Um, of the yeah, story. One, one thing we talked about was um, when the client's making a lot of generalizations. Ah. So okay. if they're talking about everything is this or nothing yes. is ever this or yes. um, that we That's can right. push back against the validity of, of generalizations. Ah. Okay, so everything is this, or sometimes it could even be all husbands are, whatever, or all wives are, or all men, or all women. So this could also be an example of generalization as well. Good, okay, let me just write down. So when clients are used generalized terms in relating the stories. Good. Thanks, Paul, and your gang of people. Generalization terms. Okay. Mm. Other groups. Other aspects within your client story that might need mm. some form of challenging from us. Yeah. Uh, our group, yeah, I'll, I'll just share for our group. Uh, sure, our group, we, we talk about how a client yeah. uh, may be always putting themselves down. Ah, we say that, oh, I cannot do this, you know, yes. well, then how, what can I do? I really cannot, la. Wow. <laughs> no, I, really, I, I don't know la. how, tell me what to do, give yeah, me advice. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Right. Okay, got it. So let me just put it down. Huh? So clients appear to be, to be, okay, rather helpless, appear to be rather helpless. Okay, rather helpless. And it might be add in something else, rather helpless. And they tend to focus on the negatives, uh, right, uh, within their story. Yeah. Oh, would that be fair to say? Uh, right? Yes. Okay, yeah? yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Xiang, thank you so much. Okay, within their stories. Very good. Thanks. Sao Xiang and your gang. Yeah. Other aspects which you may want to challenge within your client story. Um, our group also talked a bit about um, uh, when we can tell that clients have a bit of um, uh, it's a bit related to the mm. what Anne said just now but okay. I guess we put bluntly is when you know that clients are like lying to themselves Ah, okay, I see okay. Yeah, or What, not what would be a sign that will tell you that they are lying to themselves? What might be some signs that will tell you that, that, that that's happening? Uh, maybe giving a lot of excuses or, mm. uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Mm. Okay. So maybe use a particular term that you heard me use during the MI training. It will be sometimes clients might be in denial. Would that be fair to say, Joanna? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where where they what you said lah? They keep giving themselves excuses about they don't have a problem. There's no need to change, right? It's other people's problem, not theirs. That kind of idea lah. Would that, be, would that be somewhat close to what you guys have mentioned in your group discussions? Somewhat? Yeah, mm. yeah, okay. I think, yeah. One of them gave the example mm. of, um, let's say a client is trying to change a certain behavior, but then they give, mm. like, put bluntly, like, lame excuses for, uh, I can't mm. start I can't trying to that. change now because oh, I have okay. these other things I need to do. But yeah. when you hear it, you know, it's very obvious that those things can wait. But, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, let me just write down. So, so if I use your term, you'll be clients find excuses, right? Excuses, um, 
not to change. Or I might put you use my uh, use on a different term. It will be uh, clients might be uh, in denial uh, about um, the need to change. Maybe. Okay. Good. Thanks, Joanna and gang. Thank you so much. Cool. Maybe delusional. Yes, mm, Yes. Delusional thinking. Ah, thank you so much. Let me write down. Oh, delusional thinking. Yes, that's right. So clients may be expressing some form of delusional thinking. Ah, thank you so much, Narini. I will talk about it quite a lot later. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, because this term delusions sometimes can be confused from the term hallucinations. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Thanks. Cool. Keep it going. Other groups. What are the aspects within your client story which, which you may want to challenge as a counsellor? Um, remembered events. Mm. Tell me more, Jeff. What do you mean by remembered events? Mm. Um, very often we remember uh, the past in terms yes. of how we felt about those things. Okay. And very seldom we remember them in terms of facts by themselves. So mm. the client may remember things uh, a certain way because he had this reaction to that ah, event. Okay, got it. Okay, so if I may put it this way, will be um, clients may have a rather one track or a very yes. narrow yes. view la, about yes. certain things that happened to them in the past. Okay, yes. that's right. Huh? Yes. So clients, um, okay, put it this way. So clients may present. Uh, uh, a rather narrow uh, view oh, okay, about um, certain past events la, okay, in their life. Would that be fair, uh, Jeff? Would that be a fair um, way to put it? Okay, in their lives. Good. Well done. It's very, very good aspect. I'll come back to that later as well to talk about it. Good. Can I add something? Sure, go for it. Okay. Fiona. So our group, uh, we talked about irrational thinking. I'm wondering mm. whether it's related to delusional thinking where, mm. okay. mm. for example, okay. someone uh, wants to commit suicide because he or she feels like a failure, but mm. then maybe certain okay. religious beliefs um, run contrary to that idea. Sure. Got it. Okay. Let me just separate out for, 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 for now, but sometimes it might be related. So let me just separate out for you. So clients uh, may present a certain what, irrational or maladaptive thinking Oops. within their story. Thanks, Fiona and group. Good. Uh, hi, Lawrence. This is yes. Sharon here. Um, hi, Sharon. Go for it. Mm. So maybe I just share something and maybe the whole class can help me a little bit. So mm, I have sure. this client um, similar to what Fiona has mentioned that she says she wants to kill herself mm. when the grandma passed on. Mm. So the grandma is 90 years old, so grandma okay. brought her up. Sure. And she, when I tried to counsel her and told her that we want to see how we can expand some of mm. your resource, external resources, and mm. how did you cope in the past? Yeah. And she kept insisting and telling me, "Do not, do not try to convince me. Mm. My mind has, I've made up my mind, my mind. Uh, mm. to die. To okay. hold me back, not to die, is a suffering for me. To mm. let me die is a release because mm. life is so hard that." Yeah. I find even breathing is difficult. Mm. Sure, got it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. I don't know how you want to phrase it, but I, wanna, I would like to mm. hear what um, the class says mm. and um, your view as well. Okay, yeah, I will. Mm. Uh, I think I have a particular item within the handout which I'll upload later on, which will hopefully address this particular case study that you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah hopefully. Cool. Okay. I yeah. will challenge um, mm. the concept of the peace of death. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you say that again, Jeff. The peace of 
death. Oh, the peace of death, lah. That's what, you, that's what I'm hearing. Because peace this client is saying, you know, uh, it'd be it'd be great. No, it actually will be better. Mm. So tell yeah. me what is great about it, and then after that she will go into, oh, I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to do any that any, mm, mm, mm. and then we can go. Okay, so what other things won't you be able to do after that? Mm. And what you know, so uh, we don't so sort of like tell them, hey, you know, you shouldn't think like that. But we sort of like get them to realize, hey, you know, there's something else you're gonna be missing if you go that way, that kind of thing. Mm. Mm. Okay. Do. Good. Okay. So shall we we'll come back to that later? Oh, it'll be okay? We'll, we'll come back to that later. Good. Okay, quickly look at time. Let me go back to the first item. It can be any one for many for whichever item. So now they've identified what are the aspects within the client story that we may want to challenge. Now let's talk about the second question, which is what might be some possible strategies that we can use in helping to challenge these aspects within uh, our client story. So it can be any particular aspect. Uh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they came up in your discussions. Yeah, anyone from any group, you can yeah, share mm -hmm. what your group came up with in terms of strategies. Yes, Narini. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> uh, Go for it. Yes. We mm. thought about with uh, maybe even delusional thinking is yep. uh, instead of directly going for it, we might just be like, oh, so it's interesting what you said. Uh, mm. What about the people close to you? What do they think? Mm. And then if they say they say this, then we go with that perspective. Oh, what? why do you think they mm. have that perspective? And then try and Very see how they come good. out of it. That's right. Very good. So in other words, uh, we may want to explore with the client what uh, other people in their might world say, yeah, yeah, we have other people in their world, right? In their world, uh, might say about their delusional thinking, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, very, very good. Thanks, Arini. Yeah, Thank yeah, that's right. Nice. Good. Other groups. Um, we talked about seeking clarification. Mm, okay, I'm so assuming Paul, you're referring to this bit when uh, the client's using generalized statements. Or yeah, it can, it can also be the discrepancy and in, in the emotion. I mean, you can you can ask um, to to talk a little bit more to clarify what was mm. the situation, what was the emotion, um, if okay. there's a gap, you know, between, um, yeah, like how somebody's talking and the words they're using, you can seek clarification on that as well. Mm, um, spot on, got it. So okay. It just seemed to be a, a non-confrontational entry point to, mm, to, that's right. to half yeah. challenge people and open up mm. the possibility for a further challenge after the oh, yeah. clarification piece. So it's a halfway house. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Yeah, sometimes, right, all we have to do is to just be curious to ask for clarifications. And as clients begin to share with us more details, that might already be a start la, for them to rethink or to even challenge their own views already. Yeah, so spot on. Thanks, Paul. Good. Good. Other members from any other groups? Yeah. I'm wondering, yes. um, hi, Anissa here. Yeah. Yes, Anissa, go I'm for just it. wondering um, when mm. there's discrepancy between client story and emotions they express yep. mm -hmm. um maybe like reflecting what we see mm. back to them like reflecting right. their bodily um behaviors ah. or their actions back to them um or sometimes if they uh, you know something is important to them but then they minimize it by saying oh it's mm. not a big deal I, it yeah, doesn't really yeah. matter then you can kind That's of right. like reflect it back to them and, mm. and or yeah. uh reiterate maybe that it is a big deal i think that's something as well mm. that we could do yeah Okay, so two things there. One is um, reflecting back to the client the discrepancy that we observe about them. So that's one, discrepancy back to the client. Then there was a second bit about um, letting the client know that we feel that it's a big deal. That's, that's what I'm hearing, Aziza, right? Uh, yes. Mm, okay, good. Let me just reflect to the client and um, uh, sharing with the client. Um, 
what we think uh, about uh, the story that was being presented. Mm, good. Thank you so much. Anissa and gang. Yeah, good. Other groups. Strategies that you may want to use to challenge any of the aspects uh, that's in the table. Uh, using the Colum Columbo method, which is oh, wow. using the Columbo, ah, which is <laughs> slow things down uh, and you know just question ah. uh, question the, the client in terms of what uh, he's really trying to say. So this I really think can be okay. useful mm. when they mm. when they keep changing topics. So okay. you can go back and say, hey, you know, I heard you say this, and now you're saying this, that kind of thing. Mm. So that's. Mm. That's something uh, not mm. more than just seeking clarification. Is uh, using yeah, using mm. a, a, a kind of a slowing down method mm. to get okay. the clients to calm down or so. Got it. Okay, so slow the client down. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, uh, and sounds like it's a little bit like what Anissa said just now, lah. So slow the client down and also to reflect to the client uh, what you've heard them say, lah. And to hopefully, by reflecting to them what you heard them say, hopefully that will also help your client to then be able to be more clear about what is it that they really want to focus on, or what is it that's really the main point that they want to tell yeah. you. Is yeah. it? Okay, good. So, so the client down and reflect to the client. Um, to the client, uh, what you have heard them say. Good. Thanks, Jeff and gang. Thank you. Other groups? Other strategies that might come up in your group discussions? Uh, so, can I give it a try? So, mm. the one where clients you can. find an excuse not to change or they are in denial, yes. right? Ah, so yes, can we right. can we look at like something because maybe they're not ready yet, so the timing mm. is not right. So maybe we That's need right. to go back like one stage previously, mm. right? And then okay. talk about that thing before mm. the client is ready. I don't know what is that thing called. Like mm. Okay. I'm also trying to put into words. Yeah. So um Okay. Probably is to get clients to Tell us a bit more about this particular issue lah, that it seems to be having difficulty to change, but it still affects their life any, uh, I mean anyway. Would that be fair to say? Right. So that means to get clients to um, facilitate clients to elaborate more lah, huh? um, about mm -hmm, the effects of The issue, uh, yeah, so that it may provide some reasons. Hi, Lawrence. Oh, give me a second, ah. Huh? One minute, complete this bit. Give me a second, ah. Huh? Provide some reasons for the client uh, in wanting to change. Yes, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Mm. Just want to ask, would Go this be like validating the challenges? Mm. Like, that means we're basically saying, you know, mm. actually, let's just talk about the challenge. Like, get it mm. out. Yeah, that's right. Would that so, be it's that some, yeah. so it's something like um, what I taught your MI, where I'm just reflecting to the client the excuses. And mm. from there, maybe the client may then be more open to tell me more about the excuses a bit more. So something along those lines, if you, if you okay. ask me. So you might be just put it here. It's something like um, uh, you might be just put in brackets. Okay, similar to um, reflections uh, covered in MI, something like that. Yeah, okay, good. Other pointers, other strategies that came out in your group discussions? 
Uh, we also talk about asking the miracle question. Oh, wow. that's a miracle like, question, ah? Okay. Uh, which, which particular aspect, ah? Ah, okay. So um, which particular aspect? Or will y'all want maybe to the know? helpless mm. one. Ah, because, maybe just right here. Okay, okay. Over here, right? This part um, about the the neck uh, appearing ah, to okay, yeah. focus on mm. negatives. Okay, got it. So using uh, uh, hypotheticals, if I use it this way, ah. So using hypo. Um, okay, maybe use a more down to our word. Using um, the power of imagination, okay, uh, to help clients uh, to think about possibilities. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ning. Hope I, I got it right. Using the power of imagination to help clients to think about possibilities. Good. Mm. Thanks. Of course, one way will be the miracle question, uh, which I'll talk about it more under stage two. But thanks. I think to add on to what Nick said, right? Uh, I think yeah. he mentioned about hope, like even mentioned about hope, right? Yes, so he did. I think that this would be useful for this point. Mm, that's right. So uh, the point that I just typed in, uh, you know, the, the bit about the oh, imagination part. Okay, in, in a way, uh? no, it's okay, no problem. Okay, good, good. So you hear me talk a lot more about this idea when we cover stage two of the Egan's model. Yeah, so I'll get back to that later. Good. Final points that came out in your group discussions? Yes, Ning, go for it. Huh? We were like half joking, but we were talking about ah. oh, oh, tapping. <laughs> oh, Ooh. tapping, ah. wow. Okay, <laughs> Harry Roberts. Dr. Harry Roberts taught you all that, right? I'm sure. Under PCT, right? The tapping bit, ah. Okay, okay. Um, I suppose that would be a good idea to calm your client down especially when they are having difficulty relating to us about their story. Let me give you an example. Sometimes, right, when I work with people who are traumatized, especially when they just suffered the trauma a day before or last week, even as they begin to relate to me the trauma incident, you could see that they are physically very shaken, really. And whatever the hero taught you about tapping, that could actually be Apply real time here and now to help your client to begin to feel calmer as they find the words to tell us about their traumatic story. My friends, did Harold Roberts tell you all about the tapping, right? Where did he got the idea from? Which particular approach did he get it from? Did he tell you all that? Know, the, the tapping? Did he share more about where did he got the idea from? Which particular theory or approach? Uh, polyvagal. Polyvagal, okay, yes, yeah. that's right, that could be one. Now, for some of us, right, who are interested to do trauma work, there's a particular approach called EMDR, which you may want to check it out. And within EMDR, there's also some tapping we can use to help clients to begin to calm down, especially when they're relating traumatic stories to us during counseling. So let me share with you, uh, let me just uh, write out what EMDR stands for in case you want to Google or to check it out uh, on your own timing. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so EMDR stands for, E stands for I, M stands for movement, D stands for desensitization, And R stands for reprocessing. Okay. Yeah. So if you, if you check it out, you will discover that EMDR has been proven to be very, very effective to help clients who are experiencing different kinds of trauma. So yeah, so you may want to Google about it. And within EMDR, there are also some techniques of tapping that we can use to help clients to calm themselves down as they begin to tell us more about their traumatic storm. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Okay. Let me go back to my chart. Final points that came out in your discussions, that's not in your table. Okay. 
Normally. Okay, good. So what I'll do later on is I will come back to this, some of these points here. I'll also be getting Zana later on to email this particular table to all of you after lecture is over. Okay, good. So now, I want to quickly cover some of these points and then I want to share with you some other strategies that, that I put together in a handout that might help us to be able to challenge some of these aspects that, that come up in our client story. So, Zana, could I invite you to uh, upload um, the handout number four, you know, handout number three, sorry. Ah, that's right, both for the Zoom group chat as well as the link. Handout three. Okay, sure, I'll upload it now. Thank you so much, Zana. Okay, it's available on the link. I'll send it in the Zoom chat now. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. So, yeah, that's right. So you can see in the Zoom group chat, there's actually this particular handout. It's called Handout 3. Um, search one task 1b. So if you want to download it, let me just show it to you. Hmm. Okay, quickly now, let me cover with you some of the strategies here, and then I'll link back to some of the points that was being mentioned in your group discussions just now as well. Okay, so the first particular aspect within the client story, which I may want to challenge as a counselor, could be this one. When clients begin to present to me certain irrational thinking or certain faulty thinking. So example, let's say if I were to come in to share with all of you that I just filled my, what, my GCE O-level results. And because of that, I concluded that I'm therefore a failure in life, for example. So guess what? That could be an example of me having a particular faulty thinking of mine. Why? It's because failing my GCEO levels is just one aspect of my life. Having one failure in one aspect of my life doesn't mean that I'm a total failure altogether. Can you follow me, my friends? Another example, if a client comes in to see me and he tells me, well, Lawrence, guess what? I just got fired from my job. Therefore, I am a failure in my life. Once again, that will be considered a form of faulty thinking. Why? It's because just because I got fired from this job, that doesn't therefore mean that I am a total failure in life. I may fail in this job that I was fired from, but there are still other aspects of my life which I have succeeded or I've done pretty okay in. To conclude, therefore, that one failure equals to total failure, that would be considered a form of faulty thinking, a form of irrational thinking. Okay? So later on, when you go to your GD level, you will encounter this particular guy by the name of Dr. Ko Sun Ming. He will come and share with you some ideas within cognitive behavior therapy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to cover quickly some of the questions that a typical CBT guy like, would use to help clients to begin to challenge certain irrational thinking or certain of their faulty thinking. So you can see here, right? So some questions that we can ask the client could be, hmm, what are some evidence that support this idea? Notice my friends, we always want to go on the supporting track first. Why? It's because we want to build some rapport. We want to build some form of connection with the client before we challenge their thinking. Right? So we can ask, oh, so John, you mentioned, right, that um, because you were laid off from your work, you are therefore a failure in life. Hmm. Could you share with me what are some other evidence that suggest, that support this idea that just because you were laid off from your work, you are therefore considered a total failure in life. So I'm joining with John. 
I am going along with this particular faulty thinking of John. Right? To build a bridge, lah, basically, with him. After that, what do I do? After that, I want to begin to introduce some form of challenge. This is where I may want to ask John, okay, so John, what might be some evidence that goes against this particular idea? That just because you got laid off from this job, you are therefore a failure in life. So what might be some evidence that goes against this particular thinking of yours? So now, I'm beginning to present an alternative view. I'm beginning to challenge my client to think a bit more about just how valid this particular current view is all about. So this is where the challenging becomes uh, probably there. Good. Then what do we do? So after we bring in evidence against, what do we do? Then we ask the client, okay, so John, having told me about the evidence and support and the evidence that goes against, hmm, looking at both evidences, what might be an alternative view? What might be an alternative viewpoint that you can hold with regards to you being laid off from your job? So I hope John can say, well, I guess another view could be, I recognize that I have failed in my job. But failing in my job doesn't mean, therefore, that I am a total failure in life. So that could be something that could be an alternative view which I hope John can begin to see. Okay, follow me on that. So that's what we mean by an alternative view after looking at both evidences for as well as evidences against. Good. Then, sometimes, CBD people will also ask questions like, what is the worst case scenario? Or what could be the worst that could happen to you? So example, example, right? Let's say I tell all of you, oh, you know, I've been having sleepless nights ah, because, um, you know, I have this particular presentation that's coming up, you know, next week, for example. Right? And I've been, I can't eat, I can't sleep for days, for example. Then what do you do? Well, one way that you can help me challenge my thinking could be, so Lawrence, what could be the worst case scenario that will happen ah, if you were to not do well for your presentation next week? So you might help me now to see that, well, the ultimate worst case scenario may not actually be that scary. The ultimate worst case scenario may not actually be that frightening. Got it? So once again, by you asking me the worst case scenario, it might help to open me up to see that this particular irrational thinking, that things will be terrible, that things will be atrocious, may actually not be that accurate after all. So that's why we, sometimes in CBT, we will ask that question. What could be the worst case scenario that will happen if this were to not go your way, basically? Okay, good. Then of course, a lot of times, as our clients begin to tell us, right, about the worst case scenario, we normally will also ask them, like, how would you go about coping with that? But a lot of times, right, clients may think, if the worst case were to happen, confirm I will melt. In the worst case would happen, confirm I will not be able to deal with it. But it may not be so. So as we begin to ask the client this question, they may start to see la, that even if it will happen, I think I might still have some resources la, to deal with it. So once again, it's to challenge this whole notion la, that I cannot take it if the worst case scenario were to happen to me, la, basically. So it's, it's, a, it's another form of change. Good. Then we can also ask some questions about what could be the best case that could happen? Right? And also, looking at the best case and worst case, what might be the most realistic outcome that might happen? Because a lot of times, our minds like to play tricks on us. What do I mean? More often than not, most human beings, we tend to think about extremes. We tend to think about, oh, it's either the best case would happen or the worst case would happen. But more often than not, it's usually the in-between uh, that will happen. And this is where, uh, as we get our clients to think about the best case, the worst case, we will then want them to think about the most realistic outcome uh, that might happen as a result of thinking about the best case and the worst case scenario. 
So that's another way that we can help clients to begin to challenge uh, some of this thinking as well. Okay? Yeah, that's right. Now, sometimes, sometimes, right? Another way to challenge clients will be, we ask them this question. What will you tell whoever if he or she were to be in the same situation as you? Example, example, huh? Let's say I come to see all of you because I got laid off of my job and I concluded that I'm a failure in life, for example. You can ask me, so Lawrence, what would you say to your best friend if he were to say the same thing to you? That he got just laid off from his job and he's therefore a failure in life. So guess what? So as I say, oh, I probably say to my best friend, ah, no lah, he's not a failure in life. I've seen him succeed in other aspects. I've seen him do well for the other aspects of his life. So guess what? As my client begins to tell me, like, oh, this would be what I would say to my best friend. Guess what? I can then ask, okay, so what will be needed for you to say the same thing to your best friend to yourself as well? So now I can begin to turn the tables right, to the client. You can say this to your best friend. How about saying back to you as well? So once again, it's another way of challenging my client to rethink about this particular irrational thinking, this particular faulty thinking. Okay. So far, are you still with me? Okay, uh, steady. Let's continue. Now let me link up to what uh, Darini's group was actually talking about just now. Delusional thinking, since we are talking about thinking here. Uh, let me just quickly link it up here. Okay, notice, right? Darwinist group's input is rather similar to mine, or mine is rather similar to theirs. Uh. So as you can see here, right, I ask this question of who might agree with you and who might disagree with you on whatever. So first and foremost, right, let me unpack for all of us the difference between delusions and hallucinations. Okay, let me come out to join you. Now, what seems to be the major difference between delusions and hallucinations? Well, when we talk about hallucinations, it's always referring to our five senses. What do I mean? If I say to you, oh, I can see a snake crawling up your sofa. In reality, there's no snake. Lah. What do you call that? That would be considered a form of hallucination. Okay, follow me, my friends. Another example, if I say to you, oh, I can hear an old woman talking to me right now. In reality, there's no old woman lah, that's near me. What do you call that? That would be considered an audio hallucination. Another example, if I were to say to you, oh, I can feel uh, uh, something crawling up my right arm. In reality, there's nothing crawling up my right arm. Guess what? That could be a form of sensory hallucination. Another example, if I say to you, oh, I can actually smell something very pungent. Guess what? In reality, if that's not happening, that could be a form of a form of smell hallucination. Can you all follow me, my friends? So hallucinations is always tied to the five senses. Always. So how about delusions? What is the difference? Mm. Delusions is where it has to do with a particular belief. Example. I believe that my neighbors are plotting to kill me. I believe that my wife is plotting to murder me. I believe that my parents are all set to abandon me. But let's say in reality, that's not happening. What do you call that? That is considered a form of delusional thinking. Okay, follow? And this is where right, you will find that delusional thinking usually can be very strong. In other words, right, as hard as you might try to convince the client to think otherwise, a lot of times they will continue to hold very strong views about their delusional thinking. Let me give you an example. 
Quite a while ago, I had a chance to see a man who came in, and I remembered he keeps repeating to me over and over about what? That he is a good friend of Dr. Tony Tan, our ex-president. So he keeps telling me, you know, that every Sunday without fail, lah, he will have coffee with Dr. Tony Tan without fail. And he will tell me lah, that he will make countless visits to Dr. Tony Tan's house without fail. So guess what? So what did I do? I began to ask this client of mine the first two questions. Let me go back to my handout again. So I asked, let's call this particular client Peter. So I said, okay, so Peter, who might agree with you? Yeah, you and Dr. Tony Tan, you guys are buddies. You guys are close friends. And who might disagree with you? Who might have a different opinion from you about you and Dr. Tony Tan being good friends, being buddies? So what I'm doing here once again is, I am joining with Peter first, isn't it? I ask about who might agree with you. So it's always joining. Followed by, who might disagree with you? Who might have a different opinion from you about this belief lah, that you and Dr. Tony Tan, you guys are buddies? Can you follow me, my friends? Okay? Now, I must confess to you, even after we ask these two questions, sometimes clients will continue to insist that they are right. Clients will continue to insist that their belief is true. So what do we do? This is where we have to bring in the heavy artillery. So what are the heavy artillery? Well, the third and fourth becomes very important. So the third is where I probably would need to work with my client to allow me to engage the client system. What do I mean by to engage the client system? Here I'm talking about possibly the client's family. Why? Why is that important? That's important because I need some form of verification. I need some form of check. And the best way for me to get that from is by engaging with the client's family. Okay, follow? So that's something that I tend, tend to do lah, usually. And the fourth is very important, which is we may have to consider other interventions besides counselling. So what do I mean by the other interventions? Well, the other interventions could be to see a psychiatrist. Because, my friends, sometimes when delusional thinking becomes too chronic, when delusional thinking actually affects not just the client, but the people around the client, talk therapy can only go this far. We actually need the client to be on medication so that once medication begins to kick in, talk therapy can then complement the benefits that medicine is doing for the client. Can you all follow me, my friends? That's the reason why, right? One of the most difficult forms of clients that we see will be what? We call them paranoia schizophrenia. So why? Why is this population so difficult to counsel? It's because behind paranoia, there are a lot of delusional beliefs. Oh, this particular person is out to kill me. That particular person is out to betray me. This other person is out to keep me out or whatever not. So guess what? A lot of times, right, without medication, talk therapy can only go so far. But with medication, more often than not, talk therapy, counselling psychotherapy can then be better able lah, to reap some results when you work with paranoia schizophrenia. So far, are we okay, my friends? Okay, so that is something we should have to think about. Yes, I mean, I noticed hey, your hi, uh, mic. Lawrence, mm, yes. just to check with you. So delusional, okay. does it cover things like a stalking? Ah, could be. So stalking, right, will be a behavior. 
but stalking could come from a delusional thought. Example, lah, example, lah. Let's say if I have this particular belief that this particular lady is very much in love with me, but in reality that doesn't happen. What, what do I do? I may want to stalk her. I may want to make random appearances in front of her because I have this particular delusion that she is madly in love with me. Can you follow? Another example, it could be right that if I think that she's madly in love with me, right, I may want to do a lot of things for her. Example, lah, I may want to send her roses every day, but I remain anonymous. Or I may want to buy lunch, get grab delivery delivered to her, but I remain anonymous. Why? Because I continue to have this delusion that she is madly in love with me. I mean, can I understand? So the stalking, right, which is a behavior, could stem from a delusional belief that I'm having. Like, in this case, with this lady, like, whom I assume, whom I believe that she's madly in love with me. And Lawrence. Yes, we go. But most of the time, right, because mm. they believe that this is real, and then mm. when mm. we do that, they think that mm. we are the one that has a problem, and yes. they get very upset with it's us. Sure. Agreed. Mm, that's right. Mm. That's the reason why right, I was saying just now, right, that my third and fourth intervention tends to be what I will do more. About engaging the family members and also somehow trying to get this client to seek for psychiatric treatment. Because without medicine, to be honest, talk therapy can only go this far. But with medicine plus talk therapy, then uh, the overall effectiveness hopefully will go up by a little bit more. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Jeff, go for it. Mm. Okay, uh, just curious, how do we assess that the person is delusional? Okay, uh, the context mm. of this question is like this. Uh, mm. uh, you mentioned Tony Tan, right? Okay, he yes. used to come to my house, right? Mm. Okay. And I know his son's names, I know his okay. wife's name, all this. Sure. So I can claim that, right? Okay. So oh yeah, you can, you can claim it. Mm. How do you make the assessment this is delusional and not real? Mm, okay, good. So I guess it depends on me asking my client some clarification questions. So I may say, oh, so Jeff, so you happen to know Dr. Tony Tan's son's name, her daughter's name or whatever? Mm. So um, beyond just knowing their names, mm -hmm. what else would describe your relationship with Dr. Tony Tan? So uh, now what I'm doing is I'm actually asking more than that. Basically, mm. okay. If the client answers in vague terms, okay. Actually, I'm not very sure because mm. uh, he used to come to visit my grandmother sure. in Chinese mm. New Year, and so okay. uh, there appears to be some sort of familiar link. And then I will go okay. to his mother's house in Marshall mm. Road and all these things. Okay. So I can give you a lot of details, you know. Sure, you can. Mm. I could be assessed as delusional. You could be. Ah, uh, then I guess I will then come back with this idea. I will say, okay, so, um, so Jeff. Um, to what extent is your relationship with Dr. Tony Tan a key factor in your struggle in coming to see me today? Uh, okay. So for me, right, it's always about linking back to the story. Sorry, okay. Linking okay. back to the reason why he's coming to see me today. Because a lot of times, right, clients may tell us a lot of things. Oh, I'm a good friend of this person, that person, this group, that group. But after a while, lah, it could just be a smoke screen. Lah. <laughs> because it may not be related to why I did that for. Mm. But it'll be a different story, uh, Jeff, you tell me, oh, Lawrence, uh, it's related because I feel so rejected. No? Dr. Mm. Tony Tan no longer call me out for kopi. Mm. Dr. Tony Tan no longer chill me. You know? Chill means, uh, in Hokkien means, uh, he no longer uh, ask me out for outings. You know? uh, then there'll be a very different story. Because if that is the reason why he's coming to see me, then I may have to address that already. Because this will be greatly influencing the story and the issue, lah, why he's coming to see me for. Mm. Uh, so would you move away from that delusion or, or that assessment of it being a delusion mm. to address whatever it is that... Ah, okay. Good question. I guess two things I will do. Lah. I'll move on, but this will be something which I will make a note of. Because ah, okay. even as I move on to the story, right, yeah. I will want to be also listening out for could there also be some potential delusional belief in that story as well? So I guess this will be something which I want to keep about my mind. 
so that I can hopefully be able to assess better. Mm, right. So that becomes a very complex case already, right? I mean, it could be, it could be because uh, potentially we're talking about some psychiatric illness here. Potentially we're talking about perhaps uh, this client having to not just see me, but also have to see a psychiatrist as well. Okay. Yeah, right. okay, so potentially okay. that could be the implication. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Yes, I mean, go for it. Uh, sorry, uh, Lawrence, just another question. Mm. I just yes. watched a documentary on Netflix over the weekend. Mm. Yes. And it's called Beyond the Curve. Mm. And it's this group of people who believe the earth is flat. Mm. Okay. And uh, if you talk about really this is delusional thinking, mm. but this happens mm. to a group of specific people that are having their own conventions and what have you. Mm, sure. So, mm, mm. does that consider delusional? <laughs> Well, that could be one perspective you can hold. Uh, or another perspective you can hold is it be co can be considered a form of groupthink. Uh, let me bring you this word called groupthink. Now, for those of us who are in management in corporate world, this probably is a term that you are probably familiar with. Uh, it's called groupthink. So what do we mean? In corporate world, Sometimes we want to be addressing certain kinds of assumptions which are formulated by certain groups within our organization. So I guess for this particular documentary that uh, Alvin is mentioning, right? Well, I could explain it as a form of delusional thinking, or I can say lah, that this is just a form of group thing lah, where like-minded people lah, uh, come together and they continue to reinforce this idea la, that the earth is flat. Okay, yeah, so I guess that, that will be what I'll do. But like I said, I guess for me, right, when it comes to counseling, it's always about how might this delusional thinking or potential delusional thinking, how is that affected the client la, and why is he coming to see me for? So that's always the, the major thing that I want to focus on. Because if I were to go around, right, nitpicking, like, ah, that's delusion, that one not delusion, I think I might be losing focus on why the client's coming to see me in the first place. So I think it's always about going back to why the client's coming to see me for, so that I can be focused like, in assessing what is delusional and what might not be delusional. Okay? Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Alvin. Yes, okay, quickly moving on. Yes, I'm mindful of time. Two more minutes, then we go for a break. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, yes, go back here. Okay, now let me address Paul's uh, group about clients who use generalized language. Lah. Like for example, all men, all women, nobody, everybody, and all that. Lah. Now, um, there's a particular counseling theory called Gestalt therapy. Let me just spell it out for you. Spell it this way. The gestalt therapy, they actually have this particular idea called global language. Means what? Uh? Means it's another term from using generalized language. Okay. And the gestalt people always say this. Uh, when clients use generalized language, like nobody, everybody, every man, every woman, all husbands, all wives, Guess what? It could be their way of trying to not take responsibility for what they are saying, for what they are doing. So this is where, right, the Kashaw people say, whenever we hear clients use global language or generalized language, we may just want the client to substitute the global language with the word I. So example, let's say I say to you, well, you no, know, we husbands, you know, we will do this. So you might say to me, well, Lawrence, can you substitute the word we husbands to I will do this? So when I say to you, oh, uh, all wives uh, will do this kind of thing. Oh, so can you substitute the word all wives to your wife? So now you are basically getting me to what? Getting me to narrow down from something so mega something so wide to become a specific human being, to become an individual person. Can you all follow me, my friends? 
So that's something uh, which a shop people love to do. Uh. And by them doing that, they're hoping that the client will slowly but surely begin to take ownership uh, about their life. Let me give you an example. We'll go uh, for a break after that. Yes. yes Hello, Mr. So Joanna here. Yes. Can I ask a question about what you just mentioned yeah. about substituting oh, global language with ah. I? Like, I don't know if you have ever experienced you try to do that and then you can sense hmm. the client is like oh, yeah, has resistance. Course. Yeah. They might. They might. They might. Yeah, so they how might. do you work with that? How do I counter that? Uh? Good. Two things I will do. At least one thing I will do. Uh. I will use Paul's idea just now about seeking for clarification. So I may say, oh, so um, John, you mentioned about um, what? Um, nobody understands you. Mm, I wonder who does nobody refers to? Who might be included under the nobody category? So I may want to ask that. Or the client says to me, ah, yeah, every woman uh, treats me this way, for example. I say, oh, so when you mention Paul or John that every woman treats you this way, who might be some people that will be under this category? So I may want to do that. Right? So if I sense that um, my client may be resistant to the I idea, this would be my, what I might do. But for other clients that I feel that's good enough rapport, then I may just go straight to say, well, can you substitute this particular uh, term with, for example, I? Uh, so that's if I sense that the rapport is actually quite well built. But if not, then I will usually seek for clarifications first, usually. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. So I was going to share, I was going to share an example uh, that was quite influential in my life. Lah. So how many of you here are Jackie Chan fans? Ah? I hope not many. Ah. First, I'm going to say something that's quite, not very Jackie Chan flattering. Oh, okay. Lawrence, your video is off, by the way. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you so much. You didn't know. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I didn't know. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, quite a while ago, right, I remember I was a teenager then, right? Um, there was this particular news report that reported that Jackie Chan actually was found to have an illegitimate daughter. I remember when that day, when the news happened, Jackie Chan was being interviewed. Lah. And what did he say? He said, I basically committed something that most men would have committed. So I remember, right, I was a teenager then. But when I read that particular news headline, I was very disgusted. Because what Jackie was doing was what? He was basically trying to <laughs> avoid responsibility. He was using this idea of, I just committed something that most men would have done. I felt that Jackie was using globalized language. He was using some form of generalized language, basically. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, that was an example which I could think of. Okay, all right. Okay, now it's coming to 8.19. I propose to go for a quick break, shall we? And then we'll pick it up from there. Okay, so I'll be back at 8.30. We'll roll from there. So I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Okay, so 8.30. Okay. Now, sometimes, right, your client, within their story, may actually indicate that they may have certain unrealistic expectations. So, as you can see here. So, for example, they might say something like, uh, oh, um, I want to be totally confident, or, oh, I'm coming to see you because I want to be... Assertive, you know, um, by one week, or I want to be totally confident by the time I see you today, or whatever not. So, the client may appear within their story to be having certain unrealistic expectations or over the hill kind of expectations within their story. So, what do we do? Well, this is where, right, we may want to consider challenging some of these unrealistic expectations. How do we do that? Well, first, usually, right, I would want to go along with the client rather than to try and shoot down this particular unrealistic expectation. So what do I mean by go along? I will ask the client, oh, so John, you mentioned about you wanting to be totally confident after today's session, what tells you that that will happen? What tells you that this particular um, um, goal of yours will likely happen? So now, as I begin to seek for clarification, 
as I begin to ask John right, to tell me more about what tells him that this particular expectation will be fulfilled, what tells him that this particular expectation will be accomplished. Sometimes, as my client struggles to tell me, right, uh, what makes them think that it's realistic, that might already be a form of challenge for them already. Okay? So this is where uh, the power of going along with the client usually is quite beneficial. What's number one? The client do not feel that resistant towards us. And number two, while they are not as resistant, they might be more open uh, to begin to question their own assumptions. They might be more open to question their own expectations. And by doing that, we already achieve the objective uh, of wanting them to be self-challenging rather than for us to be challenging them too fervently as a result of that. So that could be one way. Now, I want to go back to Sharon's case study. Uh, this time when she mentioned about you know, this case where uh, the client just lost her grandma of 90 or 92. And she felt that um, the only way to end the suffering is by her committing suicide as well, so that she can join the grandma. Right? So I want to point you all to this particular other idea called the means and ends idea. So what do I mean by so the Lawrence, means? Uh, just, sorry, yes. Lawrence, just a correction. Yes. The grandma yes. is still alive. But still alive. Mm. just saying that in the mm. event if, if she, she pass away, pass away mm. she okay. will just die with her. Or she will die with her, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Mm. Okay. So, yes. Okay, let me continue. So what do I mean by the means and the ends idea? Okay, let me use the whiteboard to help us out. Now, when we talk about ends, we are basically talking about outcomes. For those of us in the corporate world, we're talking about KPIs. We're talking about destinations. Right? So those are under the umbrella of ends. So, how then do we define means? Well, means basically refers to the vehicle. Means basically refers to the how. The how to get to the destination. The how to achieve the outcomes. The how to accomplish the KPI. So the means here refers to the how. Okay? So a lot of times, right, Clients, they may present to us certain ideas in their story that might appear to be ends. But actually, these information, these aspects within their story may actually be just means to ends. Sometimes, right, the client themselves may think that whatever that they're telling us is considered the ends. But as we begin to ask them some questions, they start to see that, ah, whatever that I'm just telling Lawrence, they are just means to a greater end. Okay? So let me share a little bit more about how I would uh, go about counseling Sharon's client if I get to see her, basically. First thing I will do is, I will, I will, I will do this. I want to begin to ask uh, the client, let's say if I call the client Mary. So I say to her, so um, Mary, you mentioned about if your grandma were to pass away, okay, the suffering that you would feel will probably be very much unbearable for you. I would then ask her, could you describe to me a bit more about what might be the likely sufferings you might go through if your grandma were to pass away? So what am I doing now? So now what I'm doing here is, I am trying to get Mary, the client, to begin to tell me the ends, which is really about the suffering that she might go through in the event if grandma were to pass on before her. Then what do I do? Then I'll begin to say to her, 
Okay, so thank you so much, Mary, for telling me about the likely suffering that you go through if your grandma were to pass on. That I would say to her. Well, while you are right in saying, Mary, that killing yourself may put an end to the suffering, I wonder, could there also be other potential ways which you might want to manage these sufferings? Notice what I just do. I did two things. One, I acknowledged to Mary that her idea of wanting to die as a result of ending the suffering is actually one way. I'm not disputing that as a fact. So even if I didn't say it right, I'm sure Mary would have said it, I mean, or would have thought about it herself. So I'm not disputing that. But beyond just making that statement, I am enlarging. What am I enlarging? I'm enlarging Mary to think about, besides this dying or this killing of yourself as one possible way, I wonder whether could there be other ways which you may want to look into in terms of how you can be managing these sufferings. So now I'm trying to get Mary to see what? That her dying is just one of the many means out there which she can use to deal with the ends, which is managing her sufferings if her grandma were to really pass on before her. Can you follow me, my friends? So this is what I would typically do, lah, to expand on this particular conversation with Mary. Let me give you another example. Quite a while ago, I had a chance to see a lady right, who came to see me because um, she was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she actually was diagnosed with um, stage 3 breast cancer. I remember she came to see me and she was very, 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 very depressed. Right? So we talked. And I remember uh, within her story, she told me, well, Lawrence, um, I very much wanted to come to see you so that my cancer can be healed. So I remember she sort of mentioned that uh, I mean, in passing. And so I remember at some point in time, I actually asked her a question. I said, well, you know, so let, let's just, let me just call Mary again. So I said, oh, so Mary, you know, thank you so much for being so open to share with me about your struggle uh, after being told that you have cancer. And thank you so much for being so open to tell me about your expectations for you to come to see me today, which is you hope to be healed lah, as a result of coming to see me. And I asked her, well, Mary, um, what tells you that this particular expectation of yours to be healed from your cancer after talking to me will happen. And remember, after I asked her that question, Mary said, well, Lawrence, I'm sure it will not happen. Lah, but I still wish that, that it will happen to me after talking to you today. Then I began to ask her, okay, so Mary, suppose, uh, suppose for whatever reason, the cancer that you're having right now is somehow being healed the cancer you're having right now is somehow being removed from you. What differences will that make to your life, Mary? Mary began to tell me, well, Lawrence, if the cancer can be healed, removed from me, number one, I think I will once again have life back to my body. So ask her, tell me more. Oh, well, what do you mean by life back to your body? Well, you say, oh, well, I guess number one, I will start to ask my friends out, you know, for meals again. You know, oh, I suppose, right, I will want to um, um, go back to work again. Oh, I suppose, right, when I parent my teenage kids, I will be a lot more alive when I parent them. So guess what? The question that I just asked, suppose if your cancer were to be removed from you, what differences will that make to your life? What just happened? I got Mary to begin to tell me all the ends. Notice, first end, she will be asking her friends out for meals. Second end, she'll return back to work. Third end, the way she parents her teenage kids right, will be different. She'll be a lot more alive, she'll be a lot more engaged with them. So after Mary told me about quite a lot of ends, right, then I asked her, so Mary, I wonder, um, while you continue treatment for your cancer, I wonder, at the same time, would you be interested to find other ways 
to achieve some of the outcomes that you very much want to achieve if your cancer were to be removed from you. So guess what? That literally become the goal. That became the issue lah, that she wants me to help her moving forward. So she no longer wants to be healed lah, by talking to me. She knows that's not going to be possible. But I began to help her to re-engage with her friends. I begin to help her to parent her teenage children differently. I begin to help her to start to be looking out for job while she continues to go for treatment for her cancer. Okay? Am I making sense to you, my friends? So this is where uh, we want to help clients to begin to see how whatever unrealistic expectation they may have, these might just be considered means uh, to certain more valid ends. And once they start to see the link, we help them uh, to find other ways to be able to achieve the end. Okay? So that's what we'll do. Okay? Yeah, so that's what we mean with the ends and the means of idea. Okay, go back to my handout again. Okay, moving downwards. Okay, now, um, I mentioned this particular item here called Client's Disproportionate Feelings. Now, what do I mean by the term uh, disproportionate? Well, I was thinking more about the idea of a stream. So what do I mean by extreme? Well, extreme here could refer to um, what? The degree of the emotions might be way too much based on the incident that was reported. Let me give you an example. Now, we all know that anger is a form of emotion, isn't it? Now, what could be a more extreme feeling that is similar to anger? I don't know about you, it will be rich. Right? Another example? Sad. Sadness. This is a form of emotion. What is considered a more extreme emotion? that's related to sadness, in my opinion, it will be depression. Right? Another example, right? um, concern might be a form of emotion. What might be a more extreme emotion that's related to concern? Well, it could be high anxiety. Okay, follow? So, sometimes, right, when our clients begin to tell us their story at 1A, right, they might start to reveal to us, right, certain disproportionate feelings, certain extreme feelings that they're having lah, as they narrate to us their story. So what do we do? Well, at this junction, I may want to challenge I suppose challenge may not be the best word to describe here. Nah. I may want to explore. I may want to assess. Explore, assess what? So come, over here. I may want to hmm, explore and assess certain faulty thinking or certain irrational thinking which might have given rise to the client's extreme feelings. So example, example, right? If my client tells me, oh, Lawrence, uh, you know, wow, next week, right, I have this presentation that I need to do. Wow, for the last one month, I have been having difficulty sleeping. In fact, whole of last month, I only slept one hour per day. You know, I've lost 10 kg as a result of being very anxious la, about this upcoming uh, presentation next week. What happens now? 
So now, I may want to assess, I may want to find out a bit more about what might be some of the clients' faulty thinking. What might be some of my clients' irrational thinking that she might be having about her upcoming presentation next week. So, she, so I may ask, oh, so Mary, uh, as, you are think, as you are feeling this high level of anxiety, I wonder what has been some thoughts that you have about your upcoming presentation next week. What might be the worst case scenario la, that you fear will happen to you about next week's presentation? What's happening now? So now I'm beginning to what? I'm beginning to use the ideas that I shared with you just now on the first page, isn't it? Over here. Right. In particular, here. Because a lot of times, right, when we experience extreme feelings, more often than not, it's related to certain uh, faulty thinking that we have about either certain past events that happened to us or even certain future events that is likely to happen to us. So as I begin to find out a bit more about what might be this faulty thinking, guess what? Later on, I can begin to use some of these other ideas to challenge the client about this particular faulty thinking of theirs. Okay? So that's something which I may want to do. Okay? Now one more thing. Go back to the disproportionate feeling again. Now, sometimes, right, extreme feelings may also be indicative of trauma. In particular, PTSD. Let me give you an example. Now, um, I was seeing a client who actually met with an accident when he was in a cab, blue color taxi, which collided with a pickup truck somewhere within the Budok estate. For those of us who are prominent to Singapore, Budok is actually a housing estate lah, within Singapore. And guess what? When, she, when he came to see me, right, let's call him John, when he came to see me, he was telling me, hey, Lawrence, I don't know why, you know, whenever, you know, uh, I walk along the street, whenever a blue colour taxi were to drive very near to me, I feel a deep sense of anxiety. I feel a deep sense of fear. And I begin to perspire a lot. Now, what's happening here? Now, what's happening here is, this particular extreme emotion, this particular extreme feeling is probably indicative of trauma. It's probably indicative of my client John experiencing what? PTSD due to the accident that happened to him when he was in a blue color taxi which collided with a pickup truck within the Budok housing estate. Can you follow me, my friends? And what that means for you and me is we may have to do two things. One, if we are not trained to work with PTSD symptoms, we may have to refer the client on to see another counsellor who is trained to work with PTSD symptoms. Got it? Ah, for those of us who are trained to work with PTSD symptoms, this is where, you may then have to uh, ask your client, oh, so uh, do, you, do you want to do something about your anxiety over blue color taxi? Do you want to be managing your fear in regards to the blue color cap? So this is where uh, we may then want to take my, our clients to the other stages to help them, uh, or in this case to help John, uh, to begin to manage his anxiety over blue color taxi. So once again, in great depth, when you encounter Dr. Cole, you will hear him mention to you a particular technique called uh, systematic desensitization. Systematic desensitization. That is one of the uh, techniques that we can use to help clients to deal with phobias, anxiety, and even some form of PTSD symptoms as well. 
So yeah, so you can learn much from Coca-Cola when it comes to teach you that particular technique later on. Okay? Yeah. Quickly moving on. To my Okay. Now let's come to the next category, which is hmm. What happens if your client, right, were to keep telling you only negative things? I think it was Jeff's group lah, who mentioned about, oh, what happens if your client, right, uh, have a very one-track view, have a very narrow view about what happened to them in the past? Example lah, what happens if your client only remembers negative things or only um, verbalize to you negative things. No positive one, uh, only negative stuff. What do you do? Well, there are a few ways in which we can tackle this. Uh, but given the time that we have, let me propose to you uh, this particular way. Here. I would normally like to ask this particular client a scaling question. A scaling question. Why? Here comes the reason. Now, more often than not, when clients only tell me negative things, they are only thinking one track, negative. What, how can I get my client to think in a more balanced view? Well, I think proposing to them a skill may somehow influence the client to have a more balanced view. Come, let me use my whiteboard to explain this to you. Now, when clients only tell us negative things, they are operating on the zero pole of the scale. They're operating on the zero number on this scale, isn't it? So how can I challenge my client to think beyond zero without sounding preachy, without sounding imposing? In my opinion, when I ask my client a skill, it might already challenge them to not look at their past as an either or thing, but in shades of grey. What do I mean? So here we go. Now, on a typical scale, there are always what? Ten numbers, isn't it? So we have one, two, all the way until nine. At the end, will be ten, of course. Right? So what can I do? Well, one way to counter my client's negative mindset is to ask them a question. So John, um, as you were telling me a bit about your past, in particular about your childhood, I wonder if I were to ask you to scale it for me. Zero stands for, right, um, your childhood is really, really at the pits. It's at an all-time super duperly low state. That would be zero. Ten is the opposite. Where your childhood is at the best state, it's, it's, it's really at the, um, the rosiest state ever. That'll be 10. What number would best capture both the highs and the lows about your childhood? So now I'm hoping that as I present the skill to John, right? As I mentioned, what number would best represent the highs and the lows? I hope it will influence John to give me a number that's more representative of his past rather than just the zero number. Okay, follow. So I hope lah, John might say, oh, well, I suppose, Lawrence, probably a, more, a number that I will choose maybe lah, it's a two. Maybe it's a two. So guess what? Now at least, right, we have helped John to see that while his childhood is predominantly bad, there are some shades of so-called not so bad. There are some shades of goodness within his childhood. So now I can ask John, oh John, so could you share with me um, what makes you decide that it's on a two and not a zero? So now I want John to give me an account. I want John to explain to me how come childhood is at a two and not a zero? And I hope that by doing that, John might start to tell me some what, good things, 
some uplifting things, some positive things about his childhood. All can follow me so far, my friends. Ten. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, let me continue. Go back to my handout. Mm. Now, you probably have a question for me. Hey, Lawrence, what happens if your client John were to give you a zero on the scale? <laughs> now, how am I going to counter that, isn't it? Well, if my client were to tell me it's at a zero, well, the first thing that I want to do will be I really want to empathize with my client. Like mad. Lah. Because if I were to do anything else, I think my client will feel that I am not feeling his pain. I am not understanding his pain. So my client says zero. What do I do? First, I want to really empathize with my client's pain. That will be the first thing that I want to do. Second thing I want to do is, I will say to him, well, John, if I were to now ask you another skill, so now I'll ask John another skill. So what will be this? Unless I'll ask, this will be how I'll phrase it. Also, I'll say to John. So John, if I were to ask you now another skill, yeah? Now the new skill is zero, two, a minus 10. Zero, two, a minus 10. Once again, huh? minus one, all the way to minus 10, right? Very important. How I want to define zero and minus 10 has to be different from how I define zero and 10. So how would I define it? Show you how, how I would define it. I would define a minus 10 as, right? How bad his childhood work was like, right? To the point where he should have died or he would, ha would have given up like, on his life. So that would be minus 10. Zero stands for, right, his childhood was really bad, but he managed to stay alive. He was able to keep going. So that would be zero. Now ask him now. So John, what would be a number that would best represent how your childhood was like? So now notice, right, when I define zero, right, I wasn't defining zero as, oh, your childhood was great. It was rosy. No. I define zero still as, well, it was quite bad. It was really not happy. But, you know, um, you were able to get by. You were able to survive through. You were still able, you know, to um, have some brief moments of happiness, no matter how short that might be. So that would be zero. So now I'm really hoping that as I present zero and minus 10 this way, I hope lah that John will be able to tell me a number. So you might say, well, Lawrence is probably a minus eight. What do I do? Now I can ask John. Hmm, so John, so um, what actually helped for things to be at a minus eight and not worse than a minus eight? So now I'm asking more about how come things are not worse how come things are not worse off? So my friends, sometimes, right, that's what happens to clients. They can't really think on the notion of how come things are better. But they can tell us how come things are not worse off. And as they tell us how come things are not worse off, we are still helping them to see that there are still some goodness in their life. There is still some ups in their life. There's still some average in their life. Lah, even though the predominance of their childhood is still considered mainly negative. Got it? So that's what I mean lah, when I wrote here in my notes, this bit about inquiring about here, how come things are not worse, basically. So it's really about just helping the client lah, to see that, yeah, there might still be some positives, there might still be some averageness. Lah to their child. Pause a while. Any questions for me up to this point? Oh, it was clear.
Okay, can I? Quickly moving on. Now we come to the last uh, item on my handout. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Lawrence, just one yes. question. Have, Sorry, you come across, have you come across mm. any yes. uh, client that went mm. uh, minus 10? Mm. Um, so far, I have not, to be honest with you. Because minus 10, right, I define it as you, you would have died. You would have given up on your life. So if they were to choose minus 10, right, they wouldn't be here to see me anyway. Okay. <laughs> mm. So notice right, when I define minus 10, I define it as you would have killed yourself. You would okay. have ended your life. That's, that, that, that's actually minus 10. So, so far, no one has ever told me minus 10. But there were people who told me minus 9 before. The people uh, who told me minus 8 before. There were. Mm, that's right, there were. Thanks. Mm. Okay. I move on, ah. Huh? Move on. Now, let me come to the final point on my handout, which will link to another handout, lah, which is here. Okay, this final point, right, is somewhat linked to what Ning's group mentioned just now, lah, about discrepancies. So as you can see, right, so I wrote here, okay, discrepancies between clients' verbal message, sometimes, or there could be discrepancy between the client's verbal and non-verbal messages. Example, right, the sound Ning's group was mentioning, if the client were to tell me, a verbal story of how uh, he or she lost an important person in their life through death. But the way they presented the story was upbeat. Like, oh, you know, guess what? You know, last week, uh, my mom just passed away. You know, that kind of thing. What happens? So there's obviously what? A discrepancy between the verbal message and the non-verbal expression. Isn't it? Ah, so this is one, po I mean, one possibility. Right? Yeah. So, what then do we do? Well, just now I think uh, Anissa mentioned something very, very, very helpful. She said she might want to reflect to the client the discrepancy that she noticed lah, between the verbal as well as the non-verbal. So I'm going to share with you a technique lah, in counselling. It's called uh, immediacy. And this technique called immediacy is quite closely related to Anissa's uh, idea lah about reflecting to the client what we observe to be discrepant between the verbal and the non-verbal. Good. So, um, Zana, can I invite you to upload handout form? Handout form. Okay, sure. Thanks. Okay, it's available in the link. I'm sending it in the Zoom chat now. Thank you so much, Tana. Mm, okay, let me just show you what it looks like. Mm, yeah. Okay. So you should be seeing, uh, I hope you have downloaded the, the, the same document as what I'm showing. Okay, good. Okay, quickly, let me just fast forward all the way downwards. Hmm, here, this bit. Okay, immediacy. Once again, if you happen to have the Egan's book, right, you bought it, you may want to refer to the chapter on challenging skills you'll find uh, that Egan actually went on to explain quite a bit uh, about this technique called immediacy. So let me just quickly just cover this with us. Now, first thing. Now, the word immediacy basically comes from the word immediate. And the word immediate basically refers to the here and now. The here and now. So, Egan says it well. He says, whenever we observe certain discrepancy, when we observe that something don't tally with something else, well, we should 
seize the opportunity in the here and the now to present the discrepancy to the client. Why? Why the emphasis on the term here and now? Why the emphasis on the term immediate? It's because if we let the opportunity go by us, if we were to miss this opportunity, what happens? When we do bring up discrepancy later, clients may either not remember or clients may all the more deny that something was discrepant in their storytelling to us. That's why to Egan, timing is of the essence here. Timing is really what we have to grapple with lah, if we want to do good immediacy work. Okay? So I'm going to share with you some guidelines lah, about how we can go about being, dis being immediate lah, about our feedback when we observe that there are certain discrepancies lah, within our client's story. Okay, let me go back to the handout to go through that review. Okay, let me go straight down to... Mm, good. Okay, here, this bit. Okay, so a few things here. Generally, when we are constructing our immediacy message to our client, there are three guidelines which I want you to bear in mind. What are the three guidelines? Yeah. First guideline, usually it will be helpful for you and me to reveal to your client how you are being affected by them. Normally for me, right, when I observe that there's something discrepant in my client's story, I will normally go on the notion of I'm feeling rather confused. So usually, right, I will go from the angle of confusion. Because when something don't tally, usually I'll be confused about what is really what. I'll be confused about what seems to be the real deal here. So usually I will go from the angle of confusion. Then what I'll do is, I will normally share with my clients sometimes about my hunches my hypothesis about why there's this discrepancy. My hypothesis about why there seems to be this discrepancy between the client's verbal and the client's non-verbal. The final guideline, I want to then invite my client to comment on my feedback. This is where we want our clients to explore. Comment on our immediate feedback to him or her about the discrepancy part of the story. Let me give you an example um, about how I will do it. So example, if my client John were to tell me that he just passed, uh, his mom just passed away last week, and the way he said it uh, was in a very upbeat way, what do I do? This is what I will say. I say. So John, would it be okay if I were to share with you an observation that I just made a moment ago? Then I will say, well, John, um, I'm actually feeling rather confused right now because you just mentioned about an event that seems to be very sad. You losing your mom through death. At the same time, the way you presented this news to me was in a very upbeat manner. I wonder, can you help me to make sense about what's going on here? Notice, I did three things there, isn't it? First, what did I do? I actually shared with John about my confusion, isn't it? I presented to him what seems to be discrepant in his story, right? And then I actually invited John to right, share with me, make sense for me what seems to be going on here. Let's say John looks, looks at me dumbfounded. Lah. What do I do? Now I will come in to share my hunch. I says, well, John, I wonder, um, could it be that one of the possible reasons why there seems to be a discrepancy here, could it be because um, you may not feel that comfortable to reveal your sadness over your mom's death in this session? 
because there might not be enough trust uh, between us at this point in time. So now what am I doing? Now I'm proposing to John a hunch. I'm proposing to John a hypothesis that I have uh, about what could explain this particular discrepancy. Okay, follow me, my friends, so far. So that's what we mean. Uh. So I think that's why I, I very much appreciated uh, Nisa's input just now. So I think as we reflect to the client, what seems to be you know, conflicting, hopefully, uh, we hope that the client can then make sense for us uh, what seems to be going on that's underlining this particular discrepancy within his or her story. Okay, okay pause for a while. Any questions for me about this particular technique called immediacy? Lawrence? Yes. So what happens if the client still deny and then mm, he's just Then what do I do? Mm, good question. Now, two things I will do at least. Uh. First, I may just want to let it go. Especially if I sense that our rapport between us seems to be at a very premature level. I'll let it go. Second thing I may want to do is I'll ask the client, well, you know, John, um, I wonder, mm, even as you restated again that there's nothing wrong, I wonder what seems to be some reservations that you're feeling right now, lah, even as you just heard what I just said a moment ago. So what I'm trying to do here is I sense, my sense is that for the client to deny further, there might be some reservations. For the client to not own up further, there could be certain fears that he might be having. So now I want to focus on the fear. I want to focus on the reservation to see whether will my client be open to share with me what the reservation might be, what the fears might be. So that could be another thing which I may want to do. But usually for me, I will go with the first idea first, which is I will normally will let it go. Yeah, I will do the second idea. If I sense that a rapport is pretty deep, then I may want to go with the second idea about asking more about the reservations, about the fear. Mm. Okay, cool. Thank Thanks, you. Nicole. Okay. Other questions for me? Okay, yeah? good. Okay, so there we have it. Task 1B new perspectives within stage one of the Egan Skilled Helper model. Final questions about task 1B before I quickly talk about 1C. Okay, we'll do a quick role play together. Don't worry, yeah, today I'm mindful of time. I know, 9.45, I know, I know. I'm mindful about that. Yeah. I've been memorizing the timing <laughs> since last Thursday. <laughs> so I remember, I remember. Okay, huh? quickly. Now let me talk about 1C then. 1C is straightforward. Very straightforward, huh? Okay. Um, um, uh, Zana, could I invite you to upload uh, handout 5? Mm, thank you so much. Handout 5. Are you sure? Oh, 1C. Thank you so much. Uh, 1C is straightforward. Yeah, so I'll take a very short time to cover. Handout 5. Okay, I've sent it to both the Zoom chat mm. and the link. Thank you so much. Yes, so you can download either through the link or through the Zoom group chat. Okay, quickly let me show you what it looks like or how it looks like. Hmm, where am I? Here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, recap again for you. What seems to be the main objective that's behind task 1C? Well, the main objective behind task 1C is we want to help our client to, to what? To prioritize. We want to help our client to choose. Prioritize what? Choose what? We want our clients to prioritize and choose which particular issue that he or she want us to be helping them with doing counselling. Because more often than not, right, clients may come in to see us with multiple problems. They may come in to see us with multiple issues. 
This is where uh, we want the client to really be deciding, to be choosing, to be prioritizing which issue they want to be working with us on first during our time during counseling. Okay, so that's really the main objective uh, of doing task 1C, leverage, or the word value. So, could I invite you to quickly read through this handout, and then I will cover that with you. So, the key word, as you can see here, is the word choose. So we want to help our clients to choose issues to work on during counseling lah, that will make a difference to their life. So usually, right, you might have two scenarios that are awaiting you at task 1C. First scenario, your client may bring in only one issue la, for you to work on with him or her. If that's the case, what do you do? Very simple. All you have to do is to do a summary about this issue, this singular issue la, that your client brought up, and then you confirm with your client about this issue, then you have the clearance to get your clients to stage 2 of the Egan Skilled Helper model. Simple as that. But more often than not, right, things are not so straightforward. More often than not, things appear to be a lot more complicated than that. What do I mean? So here, scenario two. Well, more often than not, your client may bring up to see you several issues, several problems, several concerns. What do you do? Well, over here, you have to help your client to decide. You have to help your client to choose. You have to help your client to prioritize. Which issue do they want you to help them with lah, during counseling? So, what then are some guidelines that, that we can do to help our clients to decide or to choose? Well, here comes. Over here. Now, all these questions are all gotten from the Egan's book. You're wondering, uh, in case you're wondering where I got them from. Here, here. So basically, right, you can ask your client. Hmm, over here. <clears throat> this one. Which issue, right, if your client were to choose to work on, will make a substantial difference in his or her life? Sometimes, I will also ask my client, which particular issue is giving you the most pain? Which particular issue is giving you the most stress? Once again, my client may then choose the issue which is giving him the most stress to work on first with me during our counseling session. So that could be another question I may want to ask. Sometimes, we can also ask the client this question. Okay. So which particular issue you work at it, will have the greatest payoff value for you. That could be another question that we can ask the client that will help him or her to decide lah, which issue that do they want to be working with us first. Or we can ask the client this question. So which issue do you have the will or the courage to work on first? So now we are attacking on this idea called motivation. Because I believe that while we might have bring up multiple issues, we may not have the same motivation level to resolve all the issues. One particular issue, we may have more motivation than other issues. So this question is really targeted at motivation as well. Sometimes we may want to ask our client this question. Which particular problem, if you manage it well, it will take care of the other problems. Now, this question is pretty good if your client tells you 
that all the problems are interlinked. So this is where, if all the problems are interlinked, which particular problem, if you were to manage it well, will have ripple effects out to the other issues which are interlinked with this particular issue. So this is where this particular question may actually help your client to decide as well. Okay? Which issue that he or she may want you to be helping him or her out. Okay? Good. Straightforward. I think 1C. Pretty, pretty, pretty easy to understand, basically. Um, hi, Lawrence. Yes, Pauline. Mm. Can I just ask if... Yes. Um, sorry. Um, it's okay. Yeah, so if you actually get the um, client to identify the mm. like which problem if yes. manage can can settle all the other yeah. problems, right? Oh, well, what if this problem mm. yeah, so what if this this issue um mm. has is dependent on an external event? Ah, okay. Ah, then what do I do, right? Okay. Yeah. Then I will have to ask my client a realistic question. Example, like the client says, Oh, Lawrence, uh, I choose this particular issue, or which is um, my wife has to start to treat me differently, or my boss has to leave the company. Uh. So, guess what? Now, I think my client has no control over whether his boss will leave the company or not, isn't it? So, what do I do? So, this is where, right? If that is what my client chose, I have to ask him a question. Oh, so, John, um, how much control do you have with regards to whether your boss leave the company or not? So how much control do you have, uh, John, with regards to uh, whether your what, employee or whether your colleague treats you nice or not? So now I want to ask a follow-up question to help John to begin to question just how um, valid or just how realistic this choice of the issue will be for him. Yeah, that'll be what I'll do. Okay, Pauline, so I hope that answers your question to some extent. Hope. So, okay, so that means you ask until he defines a problem that is within his control, is that right? Yes, yes, I'll do okay. that. Mm, that's right. Okay. Yes, sometimes, right, if you want to cut the chase, sometimes I would say, oh, so John, I wonder, would it be helpful if we first focus on an issue there's more within your control. So that could also be asked as well. Yeah. So if you want to cut the chase, right, you can ask this question. But usually I wouldn't because sometimes, right, I feel that if I ask this question too soon, I may compromise on rapport sometimes. So I guess it depends very much la, on how, uh, how things are between you and your client that you can choose la, whether you want to go more direct or go more indirect, basically. Yeah. Oh. Yes, Fiona, go for it. Yes. The underlying root of the, 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 the problem. So, if let's mm. say the yes. client doesn't know what is the underlying problem that goes yes. out to all other problems, yes. what kind of questions can we delve deeper into? Okay. Yeah, to, okay. to extract that. Sure, got it. Okay. Usually, if you're on a, I would normally want to go with what my client decides. Because if I were to try and get my client right to work on what I think is an underlying problem, two things may happen. One, my client may not agree with what I deem as the underlying problem. Two, even if he does agree, his motivation level to want to address underlying problem may not be as high as his original choice of what issue he wants to address first. So normally for me, right, I want to go with whatever that my client chooses, rather than for me to try to get him la, to see what might be underlining, la, uh, be behind it, usually for me. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Other questions for me, for 1C? Yes, Pauline. All okay? Okay, huh? good. Okay, looking at time, I think it will be too rushed for us to do a role play together. Oh, good. So, why not I spend the next 15 minutes 
introducing to all of you to stage two lah, task two A. Would it be okay if you do that? Oh, okay, instead of rushing through the role play and it becomes quite meaningless after that, lah. maybe that'll be better. Okay, so come, let's just do that together, shall we? Okay, let me bring you back to the handout, uh, which I went back to handout one, the overview. Okay. Hmm. Okay, recap again for you, right? So far, we've finished looking at stage one. We have just uh, covered task 1A. We have just completed task 1B. And we've just completed task 1C. So now I'm going to attempt to start covering with all of you stage 2, looking particularly at task 2A. Over here. Okay. Now, before I do that, let me just quickly recap for you what is the overarching idea la, behind stage two. So once again, right, you can remember what I said on Thursday. Stage two. How did Gerard Egan call stage two? Well, he named stage two as the preferred picture, isn't it? So the fact that Egan used the term preferred means what? Means he wants to facilitate his clients to start to think about possibilities. Start to think about options, goals, outcomes, about a better future, about their client's preferred future. And why? Why is this so important to Egan? Well, as mentioned to you on Thursday, Egan is very big on the word hope. Very big. Why? Why is he so big on the word hope? It's because Egan believes that if the client were to experience hope during our counseling sessions, hope may give the client the energy. Hope may give the client the motivation to go on to do certain things to bring to pass their goals, to achieve their outcomes, to make their imaginative future to become a reality for them. That's why hope is a very big concept la, to Gerard Egan. Big concept. That's why he wrote in his book, that stage two and three, they are very much related. They are very much interlinked. But more importantly, stage two and three la, is really where the action may start to come forth la, by the client. Oh, okay, good. Okay, quickly now. Now I want to go through with you how. How can we start to get our client to think about possibilities? What are some ways that we can facilitate our client to start to think about possibilities in their preferred picture? Okay, good. So, um, Zana, can I invite you to upload handout six? Yeah, handout six. Okay, sure, Mr. Lauren. Thank you so much. Okay, it's available in the link and in the Zoom chat. Thank you so much, Zana. Okay, so let me just share screen with you. Okay, so I hope you've downloaded uh, what I'm showing. All done that? Okay, good. Okay, let me begin my time uh, by uh, making a quotation. 
uh, which, was, which is found in the Egan's book. This quotation goes like this. It's by this particular guy by the name of Gillette. He says, The future does not exist and cannot be predicted. It must be imagined and invented. So the key phrase here, my friends, is this bit. It must be imagined and invented. So in other words, whenever we are doing task 2A with any client, we want to begin to stretch our client's imagination. We want to begin to stretch our client's creativity. We want to begin to stretch our client's ability to think in a more divergent way. Got it? So that's really the challenge lah, when we are doing task 2A with anyone lah, uh, in counseling. Okay? Good. So come, let's do that together. So basically, right, as you can see here, I have provided for you four major options lah, in how we can be doing task 2A with our client. Look at the time, right? I don't rush it. Okay, now, let me just cover um, option 3 and 4. And I will come back to cover option 1 and 2 on Thursday when we come back together. How's that? Okay, good. So let's do that together. Okay, focusing. Let's focus on that. Now, option 3. Brainstorming. Now, you can spend quite a bit of time unpacking this technique called brainstorming in this book. So he says, he says, right, one of the best ways to encourage our clients to think about possibilities is to get them to brainstorm. So how? How can we go about doing that? Well, we can just say to the client, well, so John, why not we spend this time brainstorming what might be some possibilities for a better future for you. Could we spend this time brainstorming what could be some possibilities that might be included in your preferred future? So this is where we might just want to use brainstorming as a bridge to get our clients to start to be thinking about possibilities. Now, there are a few important guidelines which Egan mentioned in his book that will make brainstorming helpful or not. First, Egan says, right, whenever we do brainstorming, we need to suspend. Suspend what? Suspend the big J word called judgment. So what does Egan mean by suspending judgment? Very simple. Now, judgment here refers both to the counsellor's judgment as well as the client's judgment. So I say again, the word judgment here refers to both the counsellor's judgment as well as the client's judgment. What do I mean? Now, if my client starts to brainstorm possibilities, sometimes my comments may either encourage my client to do more brainstorming or to stop after a few possibilities. Example, if my client say, well, I suppose I can travel, even though we know COVID, hard to travel, right? Uh, if I were to say, well, that's kind of hard to do, isn't it? So guess what? As I mentioned that comment, what happens? My client, upon hearing that comment from me, he might start to feel discouraged or he might not want to continue with brainstorming other possibilities. So what should I say? I said, well, okay, do, do, yeah, that's an idea. Go on, go on to think about other possibilities. So that's what we mean by we want to suspend our judgment rather than to allow our judgment to put a stop to our client's imagination. Now sometimes, right, judgment may not be the counselor's problem. It might be the client's problem. What do I mean? You know, sometimes, right, there are some clients 
who tend to be very critical about themselves. Means what? After they come out with a possibility, they will immediately shut that down. Ah, yeah, that will not happen one. Ah. So what happens? So with every possibility generated, the client almost immediately will say, ah, yeah, it's such a bad idea. This will never happen. So what do we do? Well, when we encounter such a client, we need to get our client to suspend judgment. So my client say, well, I suppose I can travel. Ah, yeah, that will never happen one. I said, well, John, would it be okay if we just suspend our judgment for now? Let's just allow our creativity to go a bit wild. Let us just allow our creativity to take us to places which we may not go for now. So this is where lah, I want to really be encouraging my client to not give up so easily, to not shut down possibilities too prematurely. Can you follow me, my friend, so far? Okay. So that is something like, which Egan wrote a lot about in his book, which I tend to agree a lot as well. Like. But a lot of times, brainstorming comes to a halt when we allow our judgment to put a lid on our brainstorming uh, uh, ability, basically. So that's something which I hope you can bear in mind. Good. So that is brainstorming. Okay. Now, sometimes, right? Sometimes, huh? If my client were to be lacking certain creativity as we do brainstorming, sometimes I may want to leverage on a significant person which is considered creative lah, to the client's um, view. What do I mean? So let's say, for example, as I'm doing brainstorming with my client, example, lah, he stopped at, let's say, for example, the third possibility. Let's say he stopped already. He said, ah, Lawrence, no more. Lah. No more ideas to think about or to brainstorm about. Then I will say, so John, um, who is considered a very creative person in your life? Who would you say will be the number one lah, most creative Think out the box person in your life right now. So let's say John tells me that, well, I suppose uh, what Matthew will be this person. So I'll say, okay. So, well, if I were to ask Matthew, right, um, let's say if Matthew were to be aware about your problem, let's say if Matthew were to be in the know about your struggle that you told me earlier on, hmm, if I were to ask Matthew to brainstorm, what might be some possibilities la, for John's future? What do you think he might say? So what am I doing now? So now I'm leveraging on Matthew's creativity. I'm leveraging on Matthew's ability to think out of the box. Okay, follow my friends. So sometimes right, by doing this, it might help to prolong the generating of possibilities. Sometimes it might help. It might not, but sometimes it might. I see. Sometimes. Okay. So far, are we okay? Okay, uh, quickly moving on. Now, let me tackle the next one. This is quite cool. Here. Let me call it a day. Over here. Option four. Now, you can actually use the word examples and models as a source of possibilities. So what does Egan mean by the term examples and models? Sometimes, right, for clients who have difficulty brainstorming possibilities, we might want to encourage our client to think about real people in their life who might represent uh, the kind of preferred future which they are also aspiring to achieve for themselves. Let me give you an example. Sometimes, when I work with couples who come to see me for marital issues, what do I do? Sometimes, when I ask the couple that I'm seeing to generate what are some possibilities for a better marriage, sometimes they may come to a halt or they may not be able to generate much possibilities. What do I do? At the junction, I may say to the couple, 
Let's say the couple is John and Mary. So, so John and Mary, I wonder, is there a particular couple that is in your lives where you kind of look up to about their marriage? Is there a particular couple in your lives where the way they run their marriage, the way they conduct their marriage is kind of similar to what you also want for your own marriage? So this is where right, I'm hoping that John and Mary may start to tell me, ah, yeah, 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 come and think of it. There's this particular couple that we kind of look up to. This is a particular couple where the way they run their marriage is kind of what we aspire to run our marriage on as well. What do I do? This is where I was saying, oh, could you tell me more about this other couple's marriage? Could you describe to me more about what makes this particular couple's marriage the one? that you and your wife Mary want to aspire to pattern after. Okay, follow me, my friends. So this is where uh, we are borrowing role models. We are borrowing examples uh, in the client's life to help them to be generating possibilities that they want for themselves. But sometimes, right, I may want to also encourage my client to not just tell me one model, but several models. So I may say, that. so uh, John and Mary, besides just limiting yourself to one couple that you want to aspire to become, maybe you can think more than one couple that you will want your marriage to be aspiring to become. So this is where, as I get John and Mary to think about more than one couple, more possibilities may be generated as a result of that as well. So, so there's some different ways that, that we can be doing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Better pause. Yes, Nicole, go for it. Mm. I have a question. So mm. what happens if the client gives you a mod role model that is actually mm. not very like uh, healthy or okay? Mm. Mm. Okay. Then what do I do about it? Uh? Mm. Yeah. I guess because it's task 2A, right? Possibilities. I may still want to withhold judgment. For now, for now. Because at task 2B will be where the confronting will happen. The challenging will happen. As long as it's not something really off, for example, oh, I'll murder my wife. My wife will murder me. You know, not the kind of, uh, usually I may let it go for now. But later on at 2B, that's where I want to be challenging some of these um, uh, possibilities uh, to make it a lot more concrete. So that will come later to be. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Okay, comments, questions, feedback before we end off today. Oh, I was clear. Okay, good. So let me give you some uh, preview for Thursday. So Thursday, we'll be unpacking the remaining task for stage 2, the remaining task for stage 3. Not forgetting, I want to quickly brief all of you on the MCQ assessment as well. So I want to talk about it more. And we'll see whether will there be a time for you to do a role play together. I hope there will be a time for us to do that. Okay, so more of that on Thursday when we come back together. Until then, stay safe and healthy. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Thank you so much.